Hi, I'm Gino Oriema. We are very proud of the program we have built at the University of Connecticut. This show is about the very special women that have made UConn basketball what it is today. Joining me are two key members from our first national championship team. 1995 AP Player of the Year and Hall of Famer Rebecca Lobo, and one of the newest members of the Hall of Fame, 1996 AP Player of the Year Jennifer Rosati. Great to see you. Hi, Coach. How you been? Really good. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> My pleasure. Good, good. Um, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things here, but the first thing that we want to talk about is you mentioned a long time ago how your interest in basketball started and how when you were a kid you always wanted to play professional basketball, but it wasn't necessarily in the WNBA. Right. So how did that all kind of develop for you? Um, well, you know, I started playing when I was a little kid, older, I had an older brother and older sister and I followed them all around. And I can remember actually in college, maybe my sophomore and junior year, we were doing an interview as you and me and a couple of the other players. And um, somebody asked about playing professionally or what I was going to do when I graduated from college. Right. And I said, um, hopefully I'll play overseas for a few years and then come back to the U.S. and get a real job doing something. Right. Um, because of course there wasn't a WNBA here. And then I graduate in 95, Olympics 96, and all of a sudden WNBA starts in 1997, and I uh, haven't had to have a real job since. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, you don't. You, you're still involved in basketball, but weren't the Celtics your favorite team? Oh, yeah. And didn't you aspire at one time to play for the Celtics? Um, well, yeah, that, 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 <laughs> that is true. I, um, I grew up in Massachusetts, so a yeah. huge Celtics fan, huge Larry Bird fan. And when I was maybe sixth grade, around 12 years old, I wrote a letter to Red Auerbach. And it said, Dear Mr. Auerbach, just want you to know that I'm going to be the first girl to ever play for the Boston Celtics. And my grandmother, who lived up in that area, was going to a game, took the letter, gave it to Red Auerbach. And uh, it's funny, just um, in the past few months, I was uh, cleaning up some things in my basement and I found a letter that was written to me many many years later signed by Red Auerbach maybe it was after we won the championship or something so I didn't get to play for him but at least uh, at least I have a letter with his uh, signature on it. When did you know that going to college on a scholarship and playing major college basketball was definitely a distinct possibility? I didn't know, I knew it was a possibility um, when I was in middle school seventh or eighth grade only because my older brother was recruited and um, and went to play at Dartmouth. And I went up to basketball camp at Dartmouth. I think I was in seventh or eighth grade and one of the coaches told my parents, you know, if you think your son was recruited heavily, your daughter has a chance. And um, and so I started playing AU basketball, not until I was a freshman in high school. And I uh, got my first letter from Holy Cross. And, uh, <laughs> and then soon after that started just uh, getting recruited and realized that I might be able to play at a really big time program or at UConn. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure after being in Dartmouth camp, yeah, right. everything else was a step down. That is true, uh, yeah. Did you guys have like study hall and SAT <laughs> quizzes at that camp, or did you actually do basketball? No, we, uh, we did basketball. <laughs> so when the recruiting process started, uh, you were highly recruited. You were by some people, a lot of people, uh, the number one player coming out of high school. Um, and every coach in America came to see you play or wanted to come see you play, and you were involved with some of the best schools in America back at that time, basketball and academically. Mm -hmm. um, Virginia, Northwestern, Vanderbilt, Stanford, Notre Dame, Duke, you name them all. Um, and your mom, God rest her, Ruth Ann Lobo, was the uh, director of guidance, if I'm not, or close yeah, to it was, at yeah. Granby High School and <clears throat> what were her aspirations and goals for you? My mom's aspirations and goals for me were for me to go anywhere other than UConn. <laughs> she, uh, she was the middle school guidance counselor but still wrapped up in the whole world of guidance but more importantly she was a public school teacher in Connecticut and so all she would say is UConn's a safety school. You know, you can go to Stanford, Notre Dame, Virginia, Northwestern. 
you can go to any of those schools. You can't. You don't want to go to UConn. That's a safety school. Right. And um, so yeah, that was your job when you came on my home visit. Was yeah. you have to convince her. Um, I know in my heart I really want to go to UConn, but she that's not the place she wanted for me. Right. And uh, my very first encounter with the uh, illustrious Mrs. Lobo was um, we sat down at the dinner table and the first question she asked me is, um, my best students don't go to UConn, why should my daughter? <laughs> and you're sitting there going, ha, 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 ha. And right then and there, I started with the hands going and everything moving, trying to distract her. I was like the guy behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz, you know, don't pay any attention to that. Um, so in the end, what, what convinced her? Um, I don't know that she was convinced when I made the decision. It came down to I, I finally, I took all my visits. I promised her that um, after I had the coaches come in and talk to me, I would take my five paid visits. And um, I just told her my heart tells me to go to UConn. I really want to go there and play. And I think she trusted me enough and trusted my judgment enough to, um, to support that, even though I don't think she was thrilled about it. Uh, I mean, after the fact, she knew, she knew it was the best decision I had ever made up to that point um, in my life. But uh, yeah, she just trusted me and, and trusted the daughter that she had raised to make the right decision. The first two years for any high school kid going to college is very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I think everybody knows that. It's even more difficult when the expectations of everyone you, your parents, the fans, the media, everyone of the number one player in America going to UConn, oh my God, that's like never happened before. The expectations were such that no matter what you did, it wasn't gonna be good enough. All right. Did you feel that at all? Um, I don't think so. I don't think I really let outside expectations bother me. I think it was more the expectations within Gamble every day in practice because your expectations and Coach Daly's and, um, and everyone within our program had higher ex had such high expectations and I felt like I was always falling short of them mm -hmm. um, so that was hard but you know my parents they would have been happy just as long as I was working really hard and getting you know getting good reports from you and that kind of thing so um, because UConn wasn't UConn yet right so there wasn't you know thousands of people paying attention to everything that the basketball pl players were doing so that that wasn't there yet then your junior year how did that change? How did, did your expectations change? Did the expectations on you change? What changed to turn you from that sophomore year calling home, crying, to junior year when you finished the season uh, as an All-American? Kara Walters came and you started yelling at her. <laughs> um, I think it was just, I just grew up, I matured a little bit. I played a USA basketball team that summer and I think that playing for those teams always makes you appreciate what you have at home even more. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I just really understood what it meant to be in shape and to be mentally tough and, and I grew up. And um, I think Jen Rizzotti, even though she was a year younger, helped because she was so mentally tough and right. so focused and worked so hard, it helped the rest of us. Um, Jen and Jamel uh, coming in at the same time. but. Um, just a maturation progress probably more than anything. Well, I like to say that, that um, there was so much angst in you your junior year. I mean, um, and I think your mom was going through yeah. the battle with cancer the very first time, and you were trying to establish yourself as the great player that you wanted to be, that we all wanted you to be. And I <clears throat> was hoping that you would just take it one game at a time, one possession at a time, and not worry about what was happening, whether it was with your mom or with the next game or next year or whatever. And I remember when we finally got to your senior year, it all kind of came together and you were just playing for the love of the game, which you always loved the game. Is yeah. that is that about right? Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think my mom, my mom's diagnosis had a lot to do with that too. She told me it was December of my junior year when she told me that she first was diagnosed with breast cancer and um, that really helps you have a singular focus on things, you know, because she said take care of basketball, take care of your academics so uh, I don't have to worry about that. And so I did. And so when I delved into those things, especially basketball, I didn't ever think about what she was going through. And um and could appreciate taking things one step at a time and one play at a time and one game at a time. And I think so that 
had a big impact on me finally figuring it out by my senior year. Coming up, Rebecca talks about taking her game to the pros. Plus, you may be surprised to find out when she decided to call it a career. That's next on Gino's Legacy, presented by DeGiorgi Roofing and Siding. The final four game against Stanford in Minneapolis, I still think is one of the great performances that I've ever seen by a team, but by a player. The way Kara played in that mm -hmm. game was just, and Stanford was great. They were a great team. They had mm -hmm. a lot of great big players. Uh, but the way Kara and you helping her a lot of times, I've never, I shouldn't say I've never seen, I mean, I've seen a lot. That was one of the best things I've ever seen in the Final Four ever. She was, I mean, she was phenomenal in that game. And what did the, we ended up winning by almost 30 points that Killed game, them. I think. Killed them. Yeah, and she just picked them apart. And, um, and you know, she, she had games where she played great, and yeah. then, but she was still, she was only a she was sophomore, only sophomore, so yeah. she still had some inconsistencies. Yeah. So for her to play like that in that game um, was pretty phenomenal. And, uh, and now all you guys have the three fouls. So in the first half, we're all in foul trouble. This in the championship game. In the championship yes. game the next day. Now we go in at halftime. We're down six. Six. We're down six. You guys walk in the locker room before I get there. And what's the conversation like? If you can remember. I can't remember all that well. I'm guessing it was we played that poorly with this many of our players on the bench and we're still only down six. I yeah. think that was kind of the tone of it. Yeah. And um, That's what I said when I came in. What I'm sure say? what Jennifer and Jamel said, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to remember and we can't yeah, probably say on Jen. television. Yeah, right. that's Jen exactly I'll ask her. Said, I'll ask her when we come out. Yeah. I mean, but that team, we could talk to each other like that and nobody, yeah. nobody cared. Well, I remember coming in and saying, Seriously, like if they played without their three best players, do you think we'd be up six? And you're like, no. I said, right, we'd be up 26. And you guys are like, yeah. I said, so these guys don't have a chance. We go out. What happens? Kim makes a three. Now we're down nine. <laughs> yeah. And now, as the game is going down to the end, the last couple minutes, um, that's when you became, I think, a great player. Last 10 minutes of the game, maybe you became a great player. It was. Um, what was different? I wasn't thinking. I can remember there, there were times, there were possessions we came down, and I didn't go where I was supposed to go. I just saw a place that was open. I went and got the ball, and without thinking, just turned and shot it. And I'd never played like that in my life, where I just played and, um, and kind of got selfish, in my way of thinking, selfish, yeah. and just wanted the basketball and started shooting it. And, um, it was the best thing I ever did, <laughs> did on that day. But, yeah, I had never played like that before in my career. So when you become a pro, the Olympics are over, you win the gold medal, and you think to yourself, wait, I just won a national championship. I'm player of the year. Uh, I have a gold medal. And now I'm going to play in New York at the beginning of the WNBA. Like, if somebody said, Let, let's write a book about a kid from Southwick and let's have all this stuff included doesn't happen, right? No. And as you'd like to say, I would still be working in the tobacco fields. There That's exactly right. You. And I would be smoking those <laughs> tobaccos with the those Connecticut cigars. wrappers. Uh, That's right. Those cigars, right. Um, right. Yeah, it, uh, it was, you know, fairy tale, really. And then to be in New York and in and, and the WNBA, when it started, we were getting 15,000 people a right. game here at, at Madison <laughs> Square Garden. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it couldn't have been scripted any better. And then after that, um, the injuries, mm -hmm. cutting the career short. When did you know it's time to like, okay, I'm done with basketball? Uh, and what did that feel like? Um, my last year was 2003. I was with the Connecticut Sun, and um, it was there was a Fourth of July, and we had a game that night. And that afternoon, um, I was recently married. I had just uh, been married a couple months before. Steve and I were at uh, a friend's house, and they were having a barbecue, and people were eating hot dogs and hamburgers and drinking beer. And I was sitting there drinking water and um, thinking about the game that night where I was probably going to play 10 minutes. And I thought, you know what? I'm ready to not have my life and everything about my life revolve around basketball anymore. And it was sort of a liberating experience, actually, because as much as I loved basketball, I knew it was time for me to move away from it. 
it was time for me. I wanted to start a family and have kids. I knew I couldn't have kids and continue to play. Right. And um, so it was something that simple that just, you know, I said to myself, it's time for me to be done. And I'm glad that I'm, one of, I'm a person who doesn't need to have, I didn't need to continue to play basketball to be a happy person. So now you start your family. And when, at what point do you say, well, I still want to stay in the game? And how do I figure out a way to do that? And then, just like everything else, you know, luckily for you, some entity comes into your life and says, hey, how about broadcasting? Is this how we refer to them here at SNY? I'll, I'll, from entity? here on, I'll refer to them as some entity that entity? came into my Well, life. this is SNY. <laughs> Back then, I don't know who the heck it was. <laughs> was well, it CPTV? Was it, uh, um, who was it? Well, TIC Radio? Who was it? Well, when I, first, when I first got out of basketball, as a, um, when I first graduated, I had a couple opportunities to work for some entity in Bristol right. um, calling games. And then I had an opportunity to do studio while I was still playing. Um, and also did some for CPTV, or the other entity. And, uh, and then when I retired, so I... Um, I got in touch with the folks at ESPN and said, you know, I, I would love to have an opportunity to do some broadcasting. And fortunately, the following year, Pat Lowry was yep. the one there who had me start doing sideline. I'd never done sideline really before. And uh, so did that for a couple years and started doing some on the college side again. Um, this is all while I'm having kid after kid after kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, Prolific. Pro yeah. Prolific high school scorer and prolific <laughs> child bearer. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> That'll be on my tombstone. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So then I just got an opportunity uh, to do it. But Pat Lowry was the first one after I retired um, who, who got in touch with me and, and, and let me do stuff for the WNBA. So we've just covered 25 years? How many years? 30 years? Yeah. How many years? 20. 20. Because we went from 18 on, right? Or no? Well, no. Oh, we started back yeah, in middle 25 school. 25 or 30 years. Okay. Yeah. 25 or 30 years. In those 25 or 30 years, how do you feel? Then you get inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame, which, I mean, nobody aspires to do that. Well, I shouldn't say. Everyone aspires to do that, but you don't really plan on it. Right. So when you got the call and, hey, you're in, how's that? Um, it was awesome. I mean, I, I'd never thought about it uh, in terms of I never, I'd never thought that I would have an opportunity to be inducted into something like that. So um, I was really excited, but I was mostly excited um, because I knew how my parents were going to react, especially my mom. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was... Uh, just about a year before she died um, that we got that news and she got to go down to Knoxville and be a part of it and so that was it was just really special because because of my parents and because of her and um, and so it was you know it's something I'll never forget I think people sometimes when they ask people about these kinds of awards and these kind of accolades they, they really don't understand that you personally are like I, I don't know how to what to make of this right because it really is about all the people around me that enjoy it and appreciate it more than I do probably. Right, right. Yeah. yeah it's, it's hard to process. It is. And it, it was is. the same thing with my gold medal. You know, we won, uh, we won the gold medal in 96, and, but I was still in the middle of my career, the beginning of my professional career. So, oh, this is great. I'm going to put it aside right. now. But it wasn't until this year, this Olympics, that I really appreciated mine because my kids are watching the Olympics and my oldest daughter says, Mom, you have one of those gold medals, don't you? Yeah. She said, well, where is it? And it was in a safety deposit box. They'd never seen it. Steve had never seen it. So we went down, took it out. They got to see it. They're, they got to see kind of how cool it was. And that's when the first time I thought, this is really, really cool. It's when you get to share it with other people is when it right. means a lot. Well, do you think your children have any idea that people in the basketball world talk about Rebecca Lobo as being one of the icons in college women's basketball and one of the founding uh, members or one of the driving forces behind the WNBA being do you think they understand any of no, that? No, they have no. They're too young. They're too young. How will you feel when they are old enough to know that? I just hope they don't resent it. <laughs> I just hope that if they want to play basketball, they don't ever not play because of whatever success I had playing basketball, if that makes sense. Coming up, another member of the 95 championship team, Jennifer Rosati, stops by as Gino's legacy continues.
seems funny, doesn't it? Interview me interviewing you. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't really sure what to make of it when we were coming down this morning, but. Ah. Uh, well, I'll try to make it as difficult <laughs> as possible for you, just I'm like sure. you made it for me. Yes. Um, we we want to talk a little bit about uh, growing up and becoming a, a basketball player and uh, then getting into your pro career, coaching career. Um, people would like to know, I'm sure, your, your background, New Fairfield, mm -hmm. but Japan. Yeah, yeah. Well, I grew up in New Fairfield, and I'll never forget, I was homesick from school the day that my mom told us that we were moving to Japan because my dad worked for IBM, and they were transferring him, and it was, it was like this most devastating thing of my life. Like, you know, you think your little group of friends and your life is the most important thing in the world. So I was in Japan for sixth through ninth grade, and it was definitely four of the best years of my life. Really? Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, just exposed to so much more. We traveled the world. We were exposed to kids from different countries and cultures, and we were way more independent. We, my brother and I took the train to school an hour every day like it was nothing. So we just kind of grew up a lot, and it was actually hard to come back to the same town. Really? Because we were very different, you know, four years later, and we were coming back to the same town with the same kids. And um, it was an adjustment, but, you know, certainly I've always been grateful that we moved back to Connecticut because it could have been anywhere. And right. um, I think, obviously, timing-wise, I'm... You know, I always am, feel like I'm blessed that I was kind of came along at the right time while you were coaching. Because I don't know, if you, you know, you would have seen me coming back as a sophomore if I had played right. in a different state. Right. Did you um, did you get a chance to do any basketball in Japan? Yeah, we were we played. I mean, I, they, it was just it was an American school, so I played all through middle school. We actually traveled a lot more to play. I remember going my freshman year in high school. We went over to Hong Kong to play in a tournament. We played all the other um, American bases and like all the other international schools that were around. So played a pretty high level actually. So when you came back to play at tiny little New Fairfield High School, um, what was your high school career like compared to what you experienced overseas? Um, the level of competition. Yeah, I don't know that the level was any less because we were actually a pretty good high school team. It was an adjustment to come into a team that w had already had a, a minimal level of success and then you just kind of come in and you're the best player. Ru I ruffled some feathers, <laughs> I'm not going to sure lie. I'm sure you did. I'm so sure. So it was it was hard to come in and be young and you know, I think people were happy that we were as good as we were, but you know, at that age you're talking about high school girls, there was a lot of resentment and jealousy and I was very eager to kind of take Move the on. next step to my career. So your senior year, you guys won a state championship, yeah, my if I'm not my mistaken. Junior, junior and senior, senior year. So. And were you surprised that you weren't recruited by more schools? I, I don't really know because I, I think back then I didn't know a lot about the recruiting process. And I don't re recall like how many schools were calling and how I ended up narrowing down other than you know, wanting, knowing that I wanted to stay within a few hours of home and talk to the coaches that were interested the most in me. But I, you know, back then, I don't know that I knew a lot. I wasn't on TV a lot. I can right. remember watching, I think, Purdue and Iowa play at one point in high school and then the Final Four when Virginia was in it yeah. and Dawn Staley was there. So I remember a little bit, but I don't know that I really knew a whole lot about the college landscape. And it wasn't until I got to college and we started playing some of those schools. I, oh, I do remember thinking in the back of my head as I'm warming up, should have recruited me. Should have recruited me. <laughs> As we were beating people. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. So. I remember that. So you, 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 you come to Connecticut, and when you get there, you're like installed as the point guard. Yeah. And That's what I wanted. You early know. on, your reputation of ruffling feathers in high school yeah. continued, correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, I know I do know one of the reasons that both Providence and UConn were on my top were, was that Debbie Bear was graduating. Yeah. And then that point guard that was really good at Providence at the time was graduating. Yeah. So I, I knew what I was doing. I wanted to come into a program where I had the opportunity to play right away. And uh, it's, it's funny because I admit freely that all the times I thought you were wrong, you know, I look back and I'm sure you weren't, but you know, that was, <laughs> that was who I was. And yeah. 
I think it made me part of who I became, you know, in terms of as a competitor and as somebody who is stubborn in a good way sometimes and in a bad way other ways. And I, but you didn't ruffle my feathers no, as much as your yeah, teammates. Yeah, well, I didn't, you know, I wasn't always tactful with yeah. my uh, leadership ability, yeah. which you taught me a lot about. I, I talk about, you know, I remember having a conversation with you um, once about how it, you told me that knowing getting to know my players as well as I could off the floor was the only way that I would learn how to become a really good leader of them on the court. Like I never forgot that and I, I use that a lot in my coaching because it made a big impression on me and so but I wasn't I was you know not always the easiest person to play pickup with and I was not always the easiest person to please but you know I think that Rebecca came into my office one time and said I hate preseason <laughs> Because every game ends in a fight. Yeah. And I go, well, who fights? She says, Jen and Jamel. Yep. I said, well, why don't you put them on different team, <laughs> uh, on the same team, rather? She goes, we can't because then they win every game. Yep. So. Yeah, well, but Jamel and I would fight even in practice with you there. We no got question. We fight one time. It no was question. Like she threw an extra elbow, and I did this, and I said something. But, you know, obviously when we both got on the same page was when we were, uh, you know, along with everybody else growing up, we were, we were pretty good. That that championship year in 1995, um, that's why you came to Connecticut, because you had yeah. hoped that someday you would be in that situation. Yeah. And your relationship with your teammates and your relationship mm -hmm. with me, uh, has there ever been a time when you've been more in control of your destiny than that year? Whew, no, definitely not, because... You know how it is with coaching. You have no control <laughs> over right, the destiny right. of the team. So, but as a player, it's it's what you put out there every day, and it's what you can demand of the people next to you. And I don't think so. I mean, it's a good way to put it. I never really thought about that. But yeah, I mean, we, you know, went through that year, and you know, I don't know that any of us envisioned it would end that way until maybe the very end. Right. But. You know, I, I, I agree. We, we came to practice every day. We had a, a purpose. We felt like we had a drive. And once we got to that midway point and we beat Tennessee, it was like no turning back. You know, it was just contagious. And it was, it's pretty fun to feel that way. When, when you look back at that famous play that everybody's <laughs> always seen where the ball comes off the rim, you get it, you go down, you cross over, you make the layup. Um, I don't think you were thinking anything when that happened. What do you think when you look, when you see yourself doing that, what goes through your head? It just chills every time. Really? Because now you know it was like the play. Like it was, I think there was like two back-to-back -back layups. One was that one and another one. And it was like the defining, you know, moment of that right. game. That it was like the signal. It's like everybody says it. You know, it's like with the Sports Illustrated cover, it's, oh, remember when, you know, that's the play everybody points to. So no matter what everybody else did, or even I did in that game, it's like that's the signature play and the, the memorable play, and I think the point where we knew we were going to win. Like, right. we might have thought the whole time we could win, but when I ran back on defense and called out yeah. five, it was like we knew, like all of us knew we were going to win at that point. Did you knew Carla was going to make those free throws? Oh, yeah. Them? Yeah. That was a great call, yeah. giving her the ball. So, I mean, that, that was what was special about that team is we really trusted each other. So I think you could have drawn that play up for any of us. No, no, I couldn't have. And that's why I struggled with it. Yeah. As you guys were coming off the timeout, yeah. I'm like, who's going to shoot this free yeah. throws? Well, you might not have felt like we all would have made them, but I think we all felt right. like we right. would have made them. Like, but we I, I didn't, didn't think have any hesitation that, like, any one of us. But for different reasons, I was yeah. scared. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. because I knew you'd be out of your mind, psyched, and you would probably bang <laughs> it off the back rim. Rebecca, because she would be so nervous, like, oh, my God, I don't want to miss these. Because, yeah. you know, it's my senior year, ba da ba da ba da And... Jamel, because she would be just like you. She yeah. would squeeze the ball to that. I picked Kara because I thought, Carla, I mean, Carla. Carla, I thought she has no pulse. Yeah. Well, Remember? Yeah, that's why you make the big bucks. <laughs> that was the right decision. I'll tell you what, because we all were calm yeah. because of it, too. It yeah. wasn't like, I think she make, made us calm. Right. Like, you right. made the decision to pick her. We believed in it because right. we believed in you. We trusted her, and then her, 
she could have been as nervous as anything, and she probably was. She didn't show it. But she would never have shown it, no. and it really calmed the rest of us down. Like, she, she'll, she's got these. Coming up, Jennifer talks about her unexpected venture into coaching. Gino's legacy continues after this. So, after your pro career, which lasted... Ah, about eight years. About eight years. You played on a couple. Started in the ABL. Yep. You know, in yep. Hartford, and yeah. you um, you were a big part of that. Um, was I the most shocked person in the world when you became the head coach at Hartford, or was anybody in your family, or well, you? I was. Who? You were. Okay. <laughs> well, I remember when when Pat Miser called me because I was just finishing my first season in the WNBA with Houston, and it was like the beginning of September, and I was still in Houston because we had just come up to New York, we beat them in the garden, and then we were going back to Houston to play two, you know, one or two more games that year. It was two because it was when Witherspoon yeah, hit that. Yeah. But, um, and she left me a message and I remember saying, Sully was with me and I remember saying like, the athletic director from Hartford just left a message. Like, I wonder if she's looking for me to be an assistant coach or something. And so when I called her back, I had no expectation that she was looking to fill her head coaching position. And she was at the game in the garden. So she saw me play and it was like light bulb went off. So it was a big surprise. And it was probably more surprising than I said yes, because when she said it to me, I was like, there's no way I'm doing right. this. Right. I just started playing WNBA. I just got married that summer. Like we're, we're gonna take the winter off. We're gonna get a house. I mean, you know, it was like my life was starting. And then I drove to the interview and she off, you know, offered me the job officially. and. I remember leaving and I was like, how can I not do this? Like, how, how can I not do this? I'm 25 and she's giving me the head position. Yeah. Like, when am I ever going to get this opportunity again? And what would possess you to ask your husband to be your assistant and for him to say yes? Uh, I, I don't really know, but he was already coaching, you know, he was coaching down at Norwich Free Academy with Neil Curlin, who he still claims is one of the best he's ever coached for, and he just loved it because he had a great experience, and I was working a lot, and I was away a lot, and we just, we had talked about it and figured it was a good way for us to spend more time together. Like I said, I had just gotten married, so... And he wanted to do it. He loved teaching, but he loved, he did soccer, he did track, he did basketball. He did like every sport at NFA and he knew that this, you know, this is what he wanted to be doing. So I, you know, I had two things when I went into Pat. One, can I still play in the WNBA and coach? And two, can I hire my husband as my third assistant? So <laughs> I was asking a lot, but I think fortunately for me, she saw, she saw what I could become. And I always thought that you were, you were an extension of me when you played because I never had to worry about what was going on on the court because I always knew that you knew what I wanted yeah. and I knew what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. But I also know when I watch you coach, you're not me. Yeah. You're, you're you. Yeah. You do it the way Jen Rosati did it yeah. and the way you're doing it. And do your players know about your playing career and what you did? Yeah, they do. I mean, not. I wouldn't say as much as maybe the ones when I first got there because right. I was only 25, so most of them had, you know, kind of grown up watching the local ones, at least UConn. Nowadays, these kids, I mean, you know, they're 17 years younger than me, so they weren't even. They were like barely born when I played in 1995. Right, right. It's amazing. Um, so they they don't, you know, they they don't necessarily. Um, they may, may have never watched me, but I think having been coached by me and doing their homework when I was recruiting them, um, you know, they know a lot about my career and what I accomplished. So you've been offered so many other big time jobs. Why are you still at the University of Hartford? Um, well, one, I love it there. You know, it's I wouldn't have stayed if I didn't. So professionally, you know, I, I have the ability to be successful. Um, you know, I know that I have another level I want to reach. I want to win a national championship. And I know that, you know, Hartford's not a place where I'm going to be able to do that. But I also have some goals that I haven't accomplished yet, and I know that I can. So it's a special place in terms of being a mid-major program that has the support from the administration that allows you 
to be successful. It's, they've given me better facilities. They've given me the things that I've needed. And we've been able to attract good enough players to win championships. So I'm happy there professionally, but more importantly, I'm happy personally. I, I didn't have to move. You know, I, I lived in Glastonbury. And when I took the job, I stayed there. So I've been able to raise my family in a consistent place. My, my family and my husband's family are all from Connecticut. So I have all of my extended family within two hours of me. And now that I have a seven and a four year old, you know, they're being partially, if not 50% raised by their grandparents. Right. And that can't happen anywhere across the country. Um, so I, I have a great situation where I can raise my kids with their family and, and that's, that trumps anything professionally right now. So when the time comes that they're ready to go off, then I can think about the next phase. But, you know, it's a unique situation that I can be that happy on both fronts. So I, I, I'm not one of those people that thinks the grass is going to be greener somewhere else. Well, I'm happy for you because um, people tell me every time I go speak that uh, the best player you ever had, the face of your program, <laughs> was Jennifer Rosati, and now she's the best coach in oh, Connecticut. Nice. They remind me of that yeah, all yeah. the time. <laughs> uh. Well, thank you. That was fun. And um, our next segment, we're going to bring uh, Rebecca out, and you yeah. two can uh, go back to being, uh, you know, like uh, Jesse James and uh, <laughs> that gang. Sounds like a plan. Thanks. Coming up. Jennifer, Rebecca, and Gino reminisce about their early days together at UConn. Gino's Legacy, presented by DeGiorgi Roofing and Siding, continues after this. Well, we're back. All right. And now we've got uh, Rebecca and Jennifer uh, for um, this last segment. We wanted to take an opportunity to have you guys uh, maybe tell everybody uh, what your relationship was like when you first met and then when Rebecca graduated. Mm -hmm. And then where it's evolved to now. Uh, tell me about the first time you guys met when you visited, mm -hmm. and Rebecca was one of your hosts. I mean, I remember I stayed with her and Pam, and they couldn't have been nicer. You know, they, I think Rebecca was probably doing Pam's hair or something like that on the visit. I don't know. Uh, I don't remember specifics. Really? I remember that's we what we did. We sat around doing yeah, your hair. Did. Really? Now this yeah. is. <laughs> Your kids are not going to be watching this. Did you guys go out that night? Did you we guys did. go out that we night? We went down to Ted's. This is the some darts. This is the yeah. mom. And Ted's, by the way, is not a donut shop on stores. No, no. He, he doesn't forget anything. You and I both have kids, so we don't remember anything. <laughs> and she was, she, I remember we hosted you. Uh -huh. We weren't, Pam and I were not doing each other's hair. <laughs> and yeah, we probably went to Ted's mm -hmm. and, um, so and had, a, had a good time. Yeah. Did Pam go along with you guys? Probably so she could drive. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that would have been Well, it. probably she was the host, so she probably felt yeah, like she had felt to. Obliged, but so. I was pretty low-key on my visit, yeah. I remember. Um, and probably pretty quiet, because right. that's how I was when I didn't know people. So I'm sure they thought I was not really that cool. <laughs> and we liked you. Yeah. Why? Why did we like her? Yeah. She was friendly enough. You know, she wasn't a pain. She didn't come with 15 bags of beauty supplies no. like Kara did <laughs> on her visit. Yeah. So. And, and, and how did your, the, your relationship evolve over your three years together? Were there some rocky moments? Or was it always no. smooth sailing? Not with us two. There, maybe with me and everybody else. But. <laughs> yeah, Jen and I were, from the second she came to campus my sophomore year, we were good friends. Um, from that moment pretty yeah. much on, yeah. Yeah, we, had, we just were like the same things, you know, we watched TV shows together, we went to church together, um, you know, we went out together, we talked about boyfriends together. I mean, we just had a lot in common and we liked to do the same things and it just was a really easy relationship. We, even on the court, I feel like we never really had a lot of friction. Yeah. Right, what did you admire most about Rebecca through those three years that you were with her? Um, as, just, as a player and as a player. Yeah, well, I just, you know, we went from, you know, a couple thousand at the games to being national celebrities in some way. I remember we used to watch uh, ESPN and wait for them to, like, cover our game and how we were still undefeated. We couldn't go to the mall anymore. And um, what always impressed me the most was Rebecca's ability to handle it because I wasn't anywhere near as good as her at handling the media 
autograph requests. Like it never bothered her, um, you know, to do for others. And she was like that as a player. Like she never wanted to be the center of attention or the player of the year. It was just about being there for her teammates. So she was very easy to admire and to be friends with because she was so selfless. And I was, I don't know that I, I wasn't a selfish person, but I was just a little bit more hardcore. And so I think I learned a lot about how, you know, how the, the proper way to answer questions in the media room and, you know, to be as a teammate and to be as a leader and to have my teammates respect me the way that I respected her. And what were your endearing thoughts? <laughs> Jennifer. I, I, I respected very much on the court how hard Jen worked and um, her ability to speak her mind even if it um, wasn't everything that somebody wanted to hear. Uh, tremendous leader and um, she had all of the pieces in her personality of a basketball player that I lacked and wished that I had but it wasn't part of my personality and um, I've never had a more loyal friend. I mean she, She's loyal, like I, I don't know how to how to describe it. I mean, to, from from then to this day, if you need anything, Jen's there. You know that she um, she's just ridiculously loyal in in all the great ways. She's a terrific, terrific friend. Would you say that? Um, do you think there's been an, a time when Jennifer, except for the night in Minneapolis that we won a national championship, <laughs> that she walked around with a cellophane? <laughs> Banner, uh, around. banner around her forehead. Do you do you think there's been a time <laughs> since then that that's happened? Probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have to ask Sully Sel about that. the last few years, yeah. okay? <laughs> Maybe not since she's had children. Yes. Um, but that's that remains one of my fondest, probably my fondest memory of yeah. all of my college career was yeah. watching that national championship game with you with yeah. the cellophane around your head in Coach's hotel room that night. That yeah. was. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh! Fine. Yeah, I'll never. I said I was one when I got interviewed before. I said that one of my favorite memories of you was on the couch, Rebecca and Pam, and then like Jamel and I were like right in front of the TV, screaming at the refs, like like we didn't know what the outcome Do, was. I mean, just I think people would be surprised that we put the championship game on <laughs> after we watched it. We put it on. Yeah, I mean, after we played yeah. in it, we watched it, and these guys were sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> booing Tennessee <laughs> players doing introductions. Do you think people would be surprised to hear that? Not if they knew uh, <laughs> Jen and Jamel in any way. But they might be surprised to know that after we had won the national championship game and we were undefeated and watching the same, that he was sitting there telling us all the things we did wrong yeah. in the game as we're watching the film. <laughs> I, I do remember that part. I was sitting back there with you and Pam, mm -hmm. and these guys were right in front of the television um, after celebrating a little bit. And I did say, hey, Stop that and go back. And uh, you and Missy Rose, I think, both turned around and <laughs> gave me a symbol that made me think right I, now. Was, I, I was still number one in your heart. <laughs> Coming up, all these years later, why is Gino still angry at Jennifer? Find out next as Gino's legacy continues. What is, what is one thing, and, and this is part of the script. Uh, <laughs> you sure. can be scripted or not scripted. What, what is one thing that after you've been out of college now and you, your moms and your family life and whatever and basketball, that you think back to when you were playing, you say, you know, I wish I had the guts to say this or ask him this. Anything in particular? Go ahead. I probably said I've had the guts to say anything yeah, that I thought. Yeah. No, um, I don't know. I don't know if I remember anything. Well, no, you don't have to say anything because I'm still pissed that during the Notre Dame game in the Big East tournament, well, actually before the Notre Dame game in the Big East tournament, when you didn't play as many minutes as yeah. you thought you should have played, you... I told you. Yeah. I said, what are you upset about? She goes, you're a smart guy. Figure it out. <laughs> I said, oh. That's why I like Rebecca. She's much more respectful. Yeah. So what? I asked. Really I asked you, said that. Yeah. She said that. I asked you to change the break for me when I was a freshman because yeah, I didn't like yeah, the way we yeah. were running the fast break. So I think we did. When you so, were a freshman? Yeah. She walked well, in the know, office. Like, and I'll let it to the like two guard, and then I'd have to run down the middle, and so then Pam would pass it to me in the middle, and I didn't like because I didn't know what was around me, and I'm like, why can't they just pass it right to yeah. me? So we had just, you know. <laughs> on the side and they can just run up and I'll bring it up. Yeah, we go into the final four doing it that way, but she goes, look, I don't like it this way. I want to do it this way. 
Did you change it? Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. So uh, you've asked me a million questions yeah, I don't, during, I don't during have the interview process. To ask you. I just, instead of making me take off my heels every time I interview you these days, <laughs> can yeah. you just buy shoes with lifts? I can do that. Will you please do that? I mean, I a couple years ago. And, and now other coaches say, to me when I interview them. I've seen you take your coach shoes off for Coach yeah. Oriama. Take your shoes off when I interview them. They ask you that? Yeah. So I have to take off my shoes for everybody now. So just get some lifts. <laughs> makes my life easier. Makes I'm, you taller. It's a win-win. I'm going to have to get a lot of lifts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have everything lifted. <laughs> well, uh, I hope this has been fun for you guys. Um, obviously, we don't get a chance to do this very often. Uh, uh, in a public setting, um, <laughs> but um, I hope it brought back some great memories. It did for me, and yeah. I'm sure a lot of the fans out there were, uh, would be thrilled to listen to some of the things you guys had to say, and uh, um, can't thank you enough uh, for being a part of my life and for being a part of uh, our program, and I'm glad that we're still able to do what we do together. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.